At 5.12, it began. The rumbling roar could only mean one thing for the people of San Francisco. The San Andreas Fault was slipping. After just one minute of shaking, thousands of buildings would collapse. And in the earthquake's wake, an even more destructive force would ravage the city. This is the true story of the great 1906 San Francisco earthquake. California sits on the boundary between two tectonic plates, the Pacific and the North American. This boundary creates the San Andreas Fault, a more than 800 mile long fracture in the Earth's crust. The tectonic movement around this fault is known as strike slip, which means the rock masses slip past one another parallel to the fault line. The San Andreas Fault was first identified by UC Berkeley geology professor Andrew Lawson in 1895. This was long before Jason Morgan discovered the theory of plate tectonics in 1967. The earthquake in 1906 would be researched by scientists and would help them form the theory that elastic rebound of strained faults causes the shaking associated with earthquakes. The slipping at the San Andreas Fault can cause regular powerful earthquakes. Seismologists have discovered that a town called Parkfield in Central California consistently receives a 6 magnitude earthquake every 22 odd years. Like San Francisco, Parkfield basically sits on top of the San Andreas Fault. According to the Museum of San Francisco, earthquakes have been recorded in the area as far back as 1769. In the 1850s, some people in the area began trying to make their buildings more earthquake resistant. Despite their attempts, an earthquake in 1868 destroyed almost every building in the town of Hayward and killed an estimated 30 people. Smaller earthquakes followed in 1892, 1898 and then in 1900, destroying some buildings and killing an estimated one person. The next earthquake, in 1906, would be the big one. It's 5.12am on Wednesday, April 18th in 1906. Most of the people in San Francisco were sleeping soundly. Little did they know that five miles beneath the San Andreas Fault, the stress had become too great. Suddenly, a strong foreshock struck the city, then subsided. About 25 seconds later, an estimated 7.9 magnitude earthquake ripped through the city. A huge 300 odd mile section of the fault ruptured. Some parts of the fault line moved as much as 21 feet. All around the city, buildings collapsed. But even worse, the gas and water mains were ruptured. When the shaking stopped, the city was engulfed by fire. Most of these fires were caused by the split gas mains. To make things worse, the broken water mains made putting the fires out almost impossible. It's estimated that about 90% of the damage to the city was caused by the subsequent fires. They blazed for three days and, accounting for inflation, caused over $8.5 billion of damage. While most of the fires were started by the broken gas mains, there were accidental fires that caused a huge amount of damage. For example, the ham and eggs fire on the morning of the earthquake was caused when a woman turned on a stove to cook breakfast. She hadn't realized that the chimney was badly damaged by the quake. This caused a large fire, which leveled a 30 block area of the city, including parts of City Hall and Market Street. The ham and eggs fire raged for a full 24 hours. Some of the fires were caused by the San Francisco Fire Department itself. With the lack of water, Due to the burst mains, they resorted to using dynamite to create fire breaks. However, in experience with the use of dynamite, the firemen found that the dynamited buildings often caught fire themselves, worsening the situation. The fires were burned for around three days. Many simply went out as they ran out of fuel. Others were finally put out by the fire brigade. It's also worth noting that many of the insurance companies wouldn't cover earthquake damage. They did, however, cover fire damage. As a result, some property owners deliberately set their earthquake-damaged houses alight. 
Captain Leonard D. Wildman of the U.S. Army Signal Corps sent a letter to the Department of California saying the following, I was stopped by firemen who told me that people in the neighborhood were firing their houses. They were told that they would not get their insurance on buildings damaged by the earthquake unless they were damaged by fire. Other notable losses due to the fire took place at the California Academy of Sciences, where Alice Eastwood, the curator of botany, is credited with saving almost 1,500 specimens, including that of a recently discovered and extremely rare species. This happened just moments before the rest of the collection was destroyed. When the smoke finally cleared, over 3,000 people lay dead. Of the city's population of 400,000, it's estimated that around 250,000 of them were made homeless. Although financial aid poured into the city from the US and across the globe, the survivors faced harsh conditions. They largely slept in tents, waiting in long lines for food and other essential goods. Staggeringly, over two years later, many of these tents were still in use. During the first few days, nearby soldiers were brought in to patrol the streets. They protected what remained of valuable buildings like the US Mint, County Jail and Post Office. The soldiers were also brought in to stop the looting and rioting of evacuees. On the day of the earthquake, City Mayor Eugene Schmitz issued a famous shoot-to-kill proclamation, stating the following. The federal troops, which are now policing a portion of the city, as well as the regular and special members of the police force, have been authorized by me to kill any persons found engaged in looting the effects of any citizen or otherwise engaged in the commission of crime. Despite this order, Accusations of the soldiers looting themselves began surfacing. However, a retired captain made it clear that the majority of the soldiers served the community well. The total damage, combining that of the fire and the earthquake, and accounting for inflation, is estimated to be over $10 billion. It's also estimated that over 80% of the city was destroyed. Insurance companies were faced with almost $6 billion worth of claims. Of the almost 140 insurance companies involved, at least 20 filed for bankruptcy. Plans to rebuild the city were hatched pretty much as soon as the disaster was under control. Many business leaders downplayed the earthquake, fearing that acknowledging it would drive away badly needed investment for the rebuild. Some people even went as far as saying the earthquake had never happened. Nevertheless, the required investment was forthcoming and building regulations were changed to make the buildings more fire and earthquake resistant. The earthquake was responsible for the development of buildings like the University of California and the Pacific Heights neighborhood. The reconstruction was swift and by 1915, just nine years after the earthquake, the construction efforts were largely complete. San Francisco hosted the 1915 Panama Pacific International Exposition, which was officially to celebrate the completion of the Panama Canal, but it was also used as an opportunity by the city to showcase its recovery from the earthquake. Today, according to many leading scientists, California is overdue for another large earthquake, similar in size to the 1906 one. This theorized earthquake is known as the Big One. While many advances have been made in earthquake-proof buildings since the 1906 earthquake, many think the California Building Code, with its minimum building requirements, is not up to the task. <laughs>